So I have um, what I've done here is I've gone ahead and saved out the texture from Photoshop. I've loaded it into ZBrush and then I loaded it into the model. And I've made a BPR render, you know, just to see how it's uh, how it's all going. It's kind of hard to tell from you know from here because you know this a lot of the stitching hasn't been brought out. You know, I can see the stitching a lot more clearly than this one here. So all I would have to do is just you know intensify it, maybe paint the stitches a little bit bigger. I don't know yet. But anyways, um, it's looking a lot better now that you know there's some color differentiation here. Some of these stains are still kind of boring. I mean, I'm basically going to have to make something stronger. Maybe just maybe one big streak and maybe a little bit more around the pits. But one thing that's really uh, you know bugging me right now, and something that I really should correct before I go any further, is uh, you know I should try to minimize the more as much as I can. And at the same time, I am actually going to do something in Photoshop, in that I. You know, basically what I've done so far is I've taken the color map, the pattern, the fabric pattern, and I've loaded it into uh, Photoshop as a color. I'm actually going to separate it into two parts, uh, kind of like I had before, where I had the multiplication level pattern, and then I had the color on top of that. So let's go back into Photoshop and let's do that. So back in Photoshop, as you can see, I have all my texture maps here. And you know what? Really, I'm actually going to go ahead and... I guess what I should do is I'm actually just going to take these adjustments and uh, you know just hide them for now. I really don't need this right here. What I do need, however, is I need to have a clear view of my layers. Okay, so I have my layers here, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just desaturate this entirely. So I'm going to go to that layer, I'm going to go to Adjustments, and I'm going to go to Hue Saturation, or I can just click Desaturate. And I get something like this. That's fine. What I guess I could do is I could go to Stitches Highlights and I could probably just intensify those colors a little bit. And now that I have this pattern completely desaturated, I could click on here and then I could click on Make New Layer. So I've made a new layer and I'm going to fill this with whatever color, color I want. So I'm just going to fill it in with this brown. Now that I have this, uh, you can see my very, very ugly and dirty texture work. But for the most part, I'm just kind of hinting at things. I'm not exactly painting anything specific. And I'm just going to go ahead and just go into one of the blend modes. Uh, color burn is a bit much. Just going to change up the color modes until I get something that I like. And uh, I don't know if this is going to do it for me. You know what? Let's try to change up the color a little bit. I have to choose something a little bit more intense. And let's see how it actually affects. This color is actually pretty much dead on. So this might actually work just fine. Now, as far as, far as this color is concerned, I could obviously change the intensity of the entire color if I want. But what I really should do is I should go ahead and just copy this mask so I'm just going to go to select this mask. I guess what I could do is I just I could select this layer here. Go to Control A to select that entire mask. I'm going to go into this layer now. I'm going to create a new alpha for this layer. I'm going to go back into channel mask, and I'm going to paste that mask into that layer. And now, as you can see, we have two layers that have the identical masks. And of course, when I deselect, you know, the layers, and I deselect here, uh, the red, the redness actually goes away. For now, the redness, what it actually was, was it was telling me exactly the, um, and actually deselected my texture. But if I go back and select this layer here, you'll notice that the layer one mask, in fact, shows up. If I turn it off or on, you notice that the layer mask is being overlaid over my uh, texture. So we have this so far, and um, and yeah, the nice thing is right now is that I have a color that I can drive independently from this. And now if I want, I could go ahead and lower the intensity of the overall 
uh, you know, patterns here. I could, uh, you know, do something like even mm, go to levels. And then I could play around with the levels in here. Uh, granted, right now it's, you know, changing a lot of the intensity and I don't really want that. I actually don't like that, to be honest. Um, how could we do this in order to keep the intensity more or less the same? See, this is going to actually, I think, like, no matter what I do, it's probably just going to change the intensity altogether. I could just go ahead and just start playing with, you know, these settings to kind of try to stay true to what I had before. And in this case, what I want to do is I want to remove the blacks from here. I want to make the pattern a lot more, you know, a lot more subtle. I don't want, any, I don't want any, necessarily anything this black, this dark, or this bright. But I still want some of the pattern in there. I just want it to be very, very subtle. And of course, I could go ahead and just darken the map by doing this. And I'm going to get back at pretty much what I had. But I want to remove a lot of what I had previously. Now, at the same time, what I could do to remove a lot of this patterning in here is I could just select this texture. I could go into here and I could go ahead and I could uh, blur. Gaussian blur would do just fine. And I don't want to blur everything. Uh, you know, I don't want to. But I want to blur this texture just enough to still kind of keep some sort of pattern in there. And here you see, uh, you know, one to one preview of your texture. So imagine if my document was not zoomed in at 25%, but if I was zoomed in at 100%. So this specific layer looks like this at 100%. And I'm just going to keep blurring until I still see some of that fabric this in there you know I don't want necessarily something like this I want to get back some of my texture in here just ever so slightly like that and again it's really really subtle I can barely tell that it's there but it is in fact in there so let me go ahead and just save that shirt color Save it. Go into my model now. Load it in. And once, of course, it's loaded in, this new one here, I'm going to load it into the model. As you can see, I still have some of that moire in here. It's a lot more subtle now. It's uh, it's not quite as intense as it used to be. And again, if I zoom in, it completely goes away. But uh, let's do a render. And you know what? I could actually entirely remove it altogether. I could just leave it as a bump uh, for the future, so I could just keep this layer. And when I whenever I do, uh, you know, a future kind of bump map, you know, besides working on my color, because right now I really should be just uh, worrying about only my color. I really don't want to worry about my, um, you know, bump maps just yet. So for the purpose of texturing, really, um, what I've been using so far is I've been going into my material and I've been coloring or bumping by color. And really, that's not the best practice overall. What I really should be doing is I should be just concentrating only on the color and the color really should have nothing to do with the fabric bump. Now, granted, I'm also going to run into that problem with these jeans. But, again, uh, when I render, instead of another application, a lot of this really should go away if I handle things right. So let's render this again. I want to see where it's at, because what I see in the viewport is not necessarily what I'm going to see when I finally render this character. So I'm just going to wait a second until it does its thing. And it looks like that. And as you can see here, in fact, there is a lot less of that moire when I, uh, you know, when I just go ahead and render versus what I see in the viewport. If I go ahead and just touch this and move it, you can start noticing that it's a lot more intense. So, anyways, back into Photoshop.
so I'm looking at this and what I've done is I've gone ahead and made the pattern a lot more subtle but it's still displaying that anyways for now I'm just going to disregard that problem because again if I render this at a higher scale um, you know when the object is closer I don't really see that more uh, a problem it might also not be an issue when I go over into cinema and the way it deals with its uh, anti-aliasing within the uh, renderer it might also not be an issue so for now I'm just going to leave that again uh, out of the equation. I might actually just completely remove the bump altogether and I might just focus on, on the stitches, on the stains, and the seams and stuff like that. So for now that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go ahead and just go back into Photoshop. And again, the nice thing is about, especially with PSDs, and the fact that I am painting an actual texture, this texture will never change. This, it's not like working with, uh, like for example when you're viewing your model or using spotlight where you're constantly changing the view and you're adapting your uh, texture sample and you're rotating it to kind of fit a view and you're transferring that information you're not doing any, any of that in here the texture is laid out its UVs were laid out I have the texture already here and I can now do whatever I want to these textures and I can basically keep uh, this big Photoshop file with all the layers so at, at any time I can always just go ahead and just delete this for example it's so easy for me to do I can just delete this out of the equation altogether and it's yeah it's just it's super easy what I can do however is I can probably make a new layer that's the exact same intensity as this but it's completely flat so if I wanted to remove this out of the equation but keep uh, you know this color scheme here what I could do is let's let me just zoom in a hundred percent and I'm going to go ahead and just turn the color off for now what I will do is I will go into the color picker color picker there you go and instead of using a point sample I'm going to use a certain average now what this means is that the sample uh, you know the color picker it can either pick the exact one pixel that I picked here and it's going to pick a very specific color 142 142 142 or it can average uh, for example 5 by 5 that what that means is it's going to take whatever like wherever I land with my color picker it's going to average 5 pixels in any direction around that if I however go ahead and just average 51 pixels that's a much much bigger number and the average is you know again completely different if I move across here you'll notice that the average is still staying between 140 and 139. If I go to point sample, you'll notice that my numbers are jumping a lot more often. And that's because I'm picking a much more specific value. If I go ahead and just choose 100 by 100, you'll notice that the numbers don't change all that much. So this is a much more reliable average uh, color that, you know, that I can come with. As, as you see here, it's not really changing much. And if I go ahead and go to here, you'll notice that the color is in fact, you know, changing its variation a lot more whenever I do this. So it's changing the sample size is a much more stable solution for averaging a color. So now that I have an averaged color, I can go to this layer, I can go to paint bucket, and I'm just going to fill in this color with one, now I'm going to go ahead and just zoom out and I'm going to turn on this color and uh, I guess the other thing I have to do is I have to also have to make sure that this layer since this layer is multiply this one will be set to multiply as well and now if I turn this layer you'll see this whole thing looking like this and if I go ahead and just turn this one on more or less the intensity should be the same or close to they're both set to, oh, no, this one's, okay, so it is multiply. Okay, so these two layers are set to multiply. Both their opacity and fill are the same. So what I could do is, again, I could just either use this or this. And, you know, it is somewhat different in terms of intensity. But that's mostly because there's more white pixels in this one than in this one here. So it's not 100%. But it's closer than having, for example, you know, having guessed that value. So I can easily, for example, do something like this where I can just fade it out slightly. 
and then I can compare it with this one versus that one. But at the very least, I have that option. So I've removed the bump out of the equation. As you can see, these lines are in this specific image. So I'm just going to go ahead and just hide that for now. And I'm not going to delete this layer. And the reason why I'm not going to delete it is because I could always use it for a bump map. So in the future, when I want to create a bump map, I could very easily reuse this channel later. You know, I could reuse that layer with the bump, that pixel data. So for now, I can just go ahead and just concentrate only on the overall texture. And you know what? And as a test, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this file now with this layer hidden and this one set to multiply. And I'm going to still name it shirt color one. I'm going to overwrite that, that's fine. And I'm going to load it into ZBrush. So let me open up ZBrush here. I'm going to import this texture. No, okay, so zero one. Uh, there you go. I hope it's that one. And as you can see, that's all gone. I can zoom in as much as I want. Now, granted, again, the pattern is kind of gone. Oh, well, I mean, it is gone. So I'm not getting any of that texture that I was previously. But at the very least, I'm not getting that pat that ugly pattern all across my model. So when I zoom out to about here, whoops. And I go ahead and just use BPR now. You'll notice that, you know, when I render, it's going to be perfectly fine. As you can see right now, there's none of those ugly lines going across the entire model. Now, again, I will be saving that mostly for a bump. I might actually make that grid a little bit bigger. I could, of course, do other things to this, but I'm just going to concentrate on the color first, and then I'll const I'll worry about everything later. And of course, the same might actually go for the pants because I'm also going to have a fabric texture that uh, might actually be doing the same thing. Um, and like I said, in order to get rid of that problem, usually what you do is you just go ahead and just render bigger, and then uh, you can either resize or you know do something like that later. So I'm going to go back into Photoshop again. And I'm just going to continue working on this. And of course, I'm not going to be doing anything difficult here. Uh, I think the thing that I mentioned that I was going to do, and if I go ahead and hide and unhide this layer, it's I'm pretty sure it's empty. I'm going to focus on making a little seam right across here, or at least I'm going to darken up that section. And since this layer is below all these other layers, uh, these layers here, considering that this is below, I can very easily go ahead and just paint in whatever I like here. And not, not that, not that color. And of course I will be setting this to like multiply or something else. And right now, you know, it's looking like it's pretty dark. Again, not a problem. I can always fade it out. I can do other stuff to this later. Oops. One thing I actually don't like about working with images that are too big is that it's actually pretty slow to work on them. You know, 4K isn't exactly the end of the world, but it's a far cry from working with 2K, which I actually prefer, especially in this version of Photoshop. Now, I made a little bit of a mistake here. That's easily remedied by just going ahead and just using the eraser, a larger eraser, maybe even this. I'm just kind of fading it out there. And now I'm just going to go ahead and just go into one of the multiplayer, multiply layers. I have to choose something that's going to work. Uh, that's not too bad. Soft light. I'm actually, I could fade it out as well. And the reason why I want to do this is because I really want to create some kind of contrast between the stitches which are highlighted and the surrounding material. The nice thing is, is that now I get a highlight across this section of the model. I have a darkened part here and then I have the highlights here. Now with the highlights overall, what I could of course do, um, well I probably can't do it now just because I have all this painted, but if I had these stitches 
only isolated to one layer. I could have used the emboss and all that stuff to get some sort of lighting information in there. But at the same time, when you're painting a color map, you really probably don't want that anyways. So stitches and highlights are in here. And you know what? For now, I'm just going to turn it back into... I'm going to turn off these two layers just in case. Normal. 100%. And I'm going to go ahead and just go back into my paintbrush. And of course, I'm first of all going to make sure that when I set my color picker, it's back to point sample. So now I'm going to sample that one color there. And I'm going to go back into painting all these uh, seams here. So I'm going to zoom in, zoom back in there. And maybe even once more. And don't worry about zooming in too close. I mean, even though if it appears pixelated, that's fine. At the very least, you get more accuracy working when you're zoomed in. And considering that I'm using overlay, it's actually okay if I paint a little bit over my, uh, you know, this cavity version of my map or cavity portion of the map. And there's no way I can be perfect with this because quite frankly, it breaks apart right around here. But that's no problem either because what I can do is again, once I import it into ZBrush, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it, convert whatever color information I have. And what's going to happen then is I'm going to convert it into a polypaint and I'm going to fix up all the seams and all that stuff within ZBrush like that. Or what I could do is I could just keep the texture map as it is. I could go into ZBrush and use Projection Master or Z App Link to uh, basically give me inside Photoshop the texture on the model already. So I have two options. I can either paint the texture itself independently or I can obviously work only on the, you know, on whatever, you know, basically on the model with the texture already on it. So that way, I'll, at the very least, I'll be able to project onto the texture instead of just the poly paint, which is very useful. Because in this case, uh, do I want to necessarily lose detail from the process of, um, you know, converting from texture to polypaint and back again? Usually not. So if you want to be careful about your work and if you don't want to lose precious detail that you're putting into your work, then, uh, you know, try not to convert too much. One conversion really, you know, doesn't hurt. Especially if you have enough detail in the model and the texture. Now again, it's always very important that whenever you're transferring, uh, regardless, which, I mean, depending on which way you're going, if you're going from texture to model, make sure that your model has enough detail to really pick up all the details uh, in it, in the texture. If you're going the other way around, where you're transferring detail from polypaint to texture, make sure that you have a high-res texture. I think it's fairly obvious stuff, but uh, but I'm not gonna overlook mention that, but, uh, you know, overlook to mention that point. That needs to be said. Now, why are some of these seams uglier than others, uh, especially on the other side? Well, the reason why they show up like this is because the model is not perfectly symmetrical. So when I tried to apply these textures, you know, when I was drawing the seams from one side to another, um, what happened was, the, since the model is not symmetrical, it can't actually apply this data here onto this side of the model without, uh, you know, without it kind of breaking or without the details not being picked up. So definitely look out for that and always check your model when working symmetrically because if there's any, again, any asymmetric parts, you might lose a bunch of detail. And this really is a slow way of working because if I, again, if I had left the stitches out, 
what I could have done is I could have just gone ahead and just used the stitch brush that I had and just gone over things that way. But considering I'm pretty much, you know, I'm very far along the texturing process as it is, uh, and especially in terms of this shirt, I mean, I'm really not going to do that much more to this shirt. You know, considering the fact, I can just spend this little bit talking about, you know, basically giving you guys a bunch of notes on other aspects. So this can almost serve as, you know, this really mo monotonous process, but at the same time, I can use this time to discuss other issues. And of course, <laughs> right now, after saying that, I'm being, being completely quiet. That's kind of funny. <laughs> now, I know that so far I've been only concentrating on the color map of the texturing process and I haven't done any uh, specular maps or anything like that. And quite frankly, you really can't do that and have it displayed properly within ZBrush anyways. So I'm actually going to avoid that topic altogether. What I will do, however, is I might give you notes on what's good practice. I might uh, convert maybe one channel into a specular map later on when all is said and done, but I might leave that for the third video or video set when I'm dealing with exporting and rendering inside of another application. I might, I will probably save all of that until then. So I think what I will do is after finishing this lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a bonus video uh, later on with, uh, you know, how to handle things like, well, what I just said. Okay, so the stitches are almost done. I mean, as boring as that was, it actually doesn't take very long. But I, you know, I wouldn't want to catch anybody doing that in a production because it really is a boring process. Okay, so now what I need to do is I need to sample this color and I need to apply it to this part of the model now. So I'm going to increase my brush size a little bit. I'm going to zoom in until I see these objects clearly. And I'm just going to go over there. And of course, I really should increase my hardness just so that I don't have this very soft brush when I'm doing all this. And I don't need to be too accurate because, again, when I use my overlay, when I turn this layer back to overlay, uh, it's going to be displayed very differently. And you know what? At this point in time, I guess I probably could. I'm just going to go back into overlay. I'm going to turn this back into 80, whatever it was, percent. And I'm just going to go back into the painting mode. And I'm just going to go over these parts. And you know what? I don't, I don't really need to be overly careful here. I mean, I guess I could be if I really wanted to. But this is just small, small detail on the model. And again, I could be a lot more careful in terms of designing this texture if I had especially had a higher quality model of this area. But this character, as far as I know, will not be used in any form of close-up. And this is the back of the texture anyways, and I don't think I'm ever going to be, you know, closing up really close to the character, especially his back. And also considering that he's going to have some fur, we, he might actually have some fur over this section anyways. Again, I'm not worried at all. Okay, so I have that done. I already started up on the stains, and here they are if I turn them on. And of course, that's already like that. You know what? I'm just going to go back into this layer. I'm going to turn it back to normal and at 100%. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because I'm just going to zoom in and I'm just going to grab this color here, whatever it was. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use it around the seams just to bring out the stitches a little bit more. So I'm going to increase the brush here. I'm going to turn off the hardness value. 
and I'm just going to go over the section like that. And obviously I will be going over uh, the seam. Now, another thing I should mention is that right now, you know, I am kind of worrying about having to go over the seam. I really shouldn't because I could always just grab any one of these layers here, any one of them, and I could just copy these alpha channels from here, from here to here to here or any of the other layers. And of course right now my intensity is pretty much, you know, it's a little bit much in this area. But that's perfectly fine because what I could do in this section here is I could always just lasso any of these, uh, you know, stitches and I could very easily just lower their intensity afterwards. And of course, when, you know, when you're done doing this, I could just go ahead and just go into a blur brush. Uh, I could, for example, just choose this. I could blur all this a bunch. But before I do any of that, I'm just going to keep working around the area of the stitches. Now, when I apply this texture to add into my model now, you will actually start seeing some seams being formed by the result. And of course, the reason for that is because the colors, for example, in this section here will not match to any of these. That's again, that's fine because I can always just, uh, if I really needed to, what I could do is I could isolate any of these layers. I could rent, I could save them out as a completely different texture. I could bring it into ZBrush and use ZApp Link to fix up any of those colors and then bring in just that layer back into Photoshop and overlay it back if I really needed to do that. And you know what, I'm actually also going to go over this part quickly. And I'll probably end up going over this area with another texture and just I'm going to paint some highlights in here. Or maybe not, I don't know yet. But I might just go ahead and just blur some of this. And that might not be enough. So you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to create an alpha map. I'm going to make sure I turn on black here. I'm going to just slowly remove some of this that I've painted in. And for this one here, I don't really need to be all that dark. And the reason, of course, I'm saying that is because I'm going to go over it again, just down the center. I'm going to increase the intensity of that seam, especially right in the middle. I'm going to be, tr I'm going to try to be really accurate with this. But again, the way this map is going to be displayed on the final model is very different because again, I'm going to go into soft light. I'm going to lower the intensity anyways. And it's going to be displayed like this, so it's really not a big issue. So I have that, I have that. Still haven't worked on this part here. And now I'm just going to go back to 100%. Now, of course, it's nice to go over with this color. And the reason I say that is because, at the very least, now I have a nice fall off happening versus before I really didn't get any of that. And even going into here will probably make a big difference and maybe even between these. But when I do that, I probably should be using a slightly smaller diameter for my brush.
And now, of course, if you overdo it, you know, removing some of this isn't hard because I have this mask, which I can then use to control how much I actually want of any of this, uh, you know, shading that I've applied here. Now, I should also discuss that for the most part, well, not for the most part, but sometimes people actually frown upon doing any shading in a diffuse map nowadays, um, and rightfully so. You know, there's really good reasons for that. But if it's not distracting and if it's actually adding to the contrast of your image or of your texture and it's a drawing attention to any parts that you're, you know, you're supposed to draw attention to, then I think it's uh, perfectly fine to do so. I mean, I've worked on projects before where, you know, I was told not to do this or that, and in the end, um, you know, we were, and I, and I mean, I, I hate to, you know, cuss or say anything negative here, but, you know, I've had projects again where I kind of, I, I was going against the way of work mostly because I knew that, you know, whatever I was being told really didn't make sense. And we were overdoing certain things. And that often happens in production where things are just completely overdone. And it really drives, uh, you know, it just either wastes people's times or um, what happens is, you know, you lose a lot of efficiency. And at the end of the day, you end up going with, for example, a model that uh, that you had made for the background, and that ends up being, you know, the main model that you're rendering for a specific shot, because of the fact that, you know, that model might be just zoom by the screen, and you know you can't tell any of the details that you have put into the model, anyways. So why put yourself through all that work when you can just do, you know, keep it simple? Again, I've had those cases before. And I think that goes for most productions, really. You know, you try to make sure that you create the best you can so you can show off to your peers and you can, you know, just not necessarily show off to your peers, but, but you know, at the very least, you have something to talk about. And, you know, you really want to do your best. I mean, you're employed to do your best, so you might as well, and you know, make sense. But sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's just better to move on and get a project done on time. And again, if I really want to fix up some of the stuff, I'm just going to go ahead and just go into a blackish color here. I'm going to select the mask for this layer. And I'm just going to paint out some of this bleeding that I introduced. Or, or, I could just go ahead and just copy this layer. You know, that mask that I have there. And that way it's, it's, it's going to be a lot more precise especially around the border. Now the only time that mask is not going to work is if I had gone ahead and just started removing some of this and here using the mask, like the detail internally. Then it's, you know, then you gotta do the work on your own. Okay, so now let's zoom out. Let's look at this, and you know what? At this point in time, it's still soft light. I can just go ahead and just lower the intensity of this texture. I think it was at 83 back when. Okay, so that's... Not, not, I'm not going to call this done. What I will call it, though, is... Uh, I think it's a safe point to save, so I'm just going to go ahead and just press save. I'm going to wait until that's done, and I'm just going to re-import this texture. And whenever you're done importing all your stuff, uh, just make sure that you use the Remove Texture button. So that seems to have all the new seams on it. So you should see them appearing very soon, like that. Let's look at it a little bit closer. And at the same time from far away too. 
the reason why, of course, I want to do that is because, uh, you know, sometimes if your character is, is seen from this kind of distance, for the most part, you want to make sure that you preview your characters from the exact same distance where your character is going to be most mostly seen from. If he was only being shown from close up, then I would probably include the bump on a texture that I had. So this is actually looking okay. I have, uh, you know, a lot of dirt in the sweater. You know, the, I have a little bit more shading here going on. The seams didn't really show up much, but then again, I'm, I'm still very far away from this texture. If I zoom in and I try to render, let's see how it's going to look. But yeah, you really have to take into account exactly the distance that your character is going to be seen from, because if you end up putting, for example, you know, this much detail into a belt, if you end up adding that much detail there or even to the skin and your character is going to be just uh, a few pixels big, then you're just wasting your time. You have to think about output first. Not always, but again, you do have to consider it. If you know what your output is going to be, then definitely pay attention. Okay, so that looks pretty nice from there. Uh, let's see how it looks from the back. And I might just temporarily want to bring back the fabric pattern in here just because I want to see how it all looks with it. Okay, so I'm just going to go back into Photoshop temporarily. I'm going to switch up. I'm going to turn off this layer and I'm going to turn this one on. So now I have my pattern back in. I'm going to do the same thing again. Where I'm just going to save the texture and this time I'm going to go ahead and just very quickly go ahead and just remove texture. I'm going to remove a, a, actually a bunch of them. So remove. Okay, so all those textures are removed. And now I can go ahead and just safely import my texture. And I know that the one that I have loaded in is the last one. I'm going to go ahead and just import this texture onto this model. And now as you can see, the pattern is back in. I'm just going to go ahead and render. And check it out. And you know what? I'm actually going to cancel that for now. And I'm going to go back into material and I'm going to turn on the color bump by about 1.5, by about a value of 1.5. And now I'm going to hit BPR again and render. As you can see, this actually looks really ugly right now in the viewport, but let's see what happens when I render. Like all the stitching is actually pretty ugly here. As you can see when I render, it's actually nice and smooth. This one is still very small, so I can't really fix that one here, but this looks a lot nicer. And you know what, in the pattern that I have on this model, I mean, it really helps having it in the render. You know, at the very least it adds, it adds that little extra yeah, I mean, I don't know, I guess I could call it the extra oomph, but it definitely helps. If I zoom out, of course, it all starts to kind of break apart, especially around here. You know, it starts to moire. Now when I render, it's again, it's still somewhat in there, but it's not that bad. Um, okay, so you know what, let, let me just work a little bit more on this, you know, on the dirt. And I'm going to call it pretty much a day for this texture. And then I'm going to work on the pants. Because I really don't want to spend like the next uh, five days texturing this, this shirt. So I'm going to go back into the stain 01 and stain 02. I'm just going to work, I'm actually going to zoom out first, because I really want to see the majority of my texture here. And I'm going to go back into here, maybe choose this texture sample. And what I could do is actually I could just go ahead and just create a new texture sample altogether. I'm going to size up this brush and just paint something like that. And I know that I'm being kind of careless here, but it's okay. 
All I have to do is just fade all this stuff out. What I could also do is I could go ahead and just use the blur brush here. I could very easily blur all this stuff up. And I could just up the strength. And in this case, it's probably not enough, so I might have to resort to blurring using the Gaussian blur and going ahead and just using a higher value here. And what I could do also is I could also resort to selections. So if I go ahead and just use the lasso selection and I could just select a part of this thing here and then I go to select and then use feather. If I use a feather of, I don't know, about 20 pixels, 20 or maybe even 30, let's choose 30. And now I go ahead and use the blur Gaussian. What you'll notice is that this fade isn't necessarily instant, or at least it shouldn't be. It doesn't go from one pixel to another and just automatically creates this, um, you know, straight or very harsh line. If I, of course, don't do that, if I just go ahead and just select this, and then I go to filter Gaussian blur and I blur it by, you know, X amount, and then I deselect, you should notice that there's a fine line right across here. If I zoom in even more, you'll notice it more. See that? You have a very clear line of where it started to blur a lot. You don't see that here. Of course, the reason being is that if I just go ahead and undo that, I'm going to do the same thing now, except I'm going to go to Select, Modify, Feather. I'm blurring the actual selection. Now, Photoshop can't actually show me the blur, so I'm just going to go ahead and maybe even a radius of 40. And I'm going to go ahead and just blur Gaussian. And I'm going to blur by the same amount that I had before. And press this. And I can't really tell that line. You know, it's gone. I'm just going to undo that because I actually did blur by a little bit too much. So I'm going to remove some of that. I'm still going to blur, just again, not as much. Something like that works. And of course I could keep doing that with a varied levels of blurriness. I could of course just maybe select this. Again, modify feather, so shift F6 if you want. Of course those hotkeys aren't exactly side by side. Maybe even 25. Then go to Gaussian Blur and remove however much you need. Just blur it just enough so that it appears like a stain, but it's not, uh, you know, perfectly like that. Like, I don't want it to be all too harsh. So this is actually a little bit better. And of course, I could just continue doing this. I could just go back to my brush and I could just keep, I, I could just keep putting it down uh, dirt. I could also even paint in leaves if I want. You know, it really doesn't matter what I paint onto there because I'm going to be blurring it at the end of the day anyways. I could of course choose maybe this one here. This is actually a nice dirt brush, even though I'm painting leaves onto here. Now I could just use this. It's perfectly fine, especially if you're using this brush at different, uh, you know, diameters. I think it works perfectly fine. Okay, so now of course I'm just going to go back into the same process. I'm going to select some portions of this. Select, modify, feather, 25 is fine. Filter, Gaussian blur, and just control the amount that you're going to be blurring by. And I'm just going to blur just enough. Like I said, I don't want to blur too much. I don't want to blur too little. I want to blur just enough so that I can still see some of the harsher edges in here, but I don't actually see the leaf texture. And now the nice thing about this is that you see the streaks here, you see the dots, the spots, whatever. You know, it almost looks like there's some smudges and other things on this material. At the end of the day, what you want is you want to almost give the impression as if something had either, um, you know, that there's been different variations of dirt being applied. There's some stains. There's, um, you know, it could be from oil. Maybe the character's been rubbing his fingers against his shirt. Maybe there's some, uh, you know, other 
kind of things being uh, maybe he's just putting himself against a, a dirty car or you know some dirty piece of machinery. So there's different levels of smudginess, as in like different uh, thicknesses to all of it. You, know, you have to think about that too. Exactly what is it that your character is interacting with? And again, this process is kind of boring. I mean, you know, there's really not much to it. It's just a lot of repetition. And I kind of wish that there was a faster way to do all of this. And I could build myself a macro for this. But at the same time, I kind of can't. And I know I hate to say that, that you know, that you can't. But considering that I have to go into Feather and... Uh, well, actually, for the Feather, I, I could probably just reassign and use a different hotkey. But for blurring here... I kind of need a hotkey for this, and I might actually create one if I can. Um, I haven't actually ever tried, but if I go ahead and just create a hotkey for this, I do need to always control this value here. So that's why I can't just create a macro, because I still have to control this one piece here. I'm just going to go ahead and just, again, feather, filter, and I'm just going to go ahead and just go Gaussian Blur. It's just the same value there. Now for this, again, same process. Modify feather, da da da. Now there is actually another way that I could have done this possibly. Um, what I could have done is, which I'm not sure if I could necessarily do that in Photoshop. I know in Shake I would have possibly done things a little bit different. Because in Shake what I would have done is I would have assigned a blur and then a mask and then would have just kept uh, you know, blurring and blurring certain sections. Um, but you can't necessarily blur different intensities to uh, different parts, especially on the same texture. You can just fade in stuff in and out. So anyways, uh, this is pretty good. And before I do anything, actually, I'm probably just going to mask that in entirely and just Gaussian blur that stuff up. Okay, so now I'm just going to go ahead and just test out this texture once again. Go back into ZBrush, go into Textura, wait until it loads. Select my texture that I'm working with. And now you, you can see a bunch more stains on this texture. Very nice. It's not perfect. But it's okay. Might actually add a few to the, uh, you know, especially on this area of the shirt. Maybe even a little bit more to the bottom. I mean, what if he's sweating? What if, you know, what if there's just more going on in this area? Right now, there really isn't. Of course, this also needs some work. So for now, I have only details in the front here, and that's not too bad. I mean, I'm guessing that he's mostly just touching especially this section of his shirt, not so much the actual sleeves. But these stains are starting to look better and better. So now I'm just rendering, I'm going to see how this looks. You know what, let me just bump up the material the bump a little bit. And again, it looks kind of ugly here, but if I zoom in, it actually looks okay. So I'm going to do another render. And of course, this material, when I'm applying it, you know, the bump, it's actually applying to the entire model uh, for the most part. So you'll see extra bump here, extra bump here. But I'm not really worried about that right now. I'm actually only worried about the t-shirt because I haven't painted different materials for any of these objects for me to, you know, control and do all that stuff with. Um, yeah, I'm kind of liking it. I could probably add a little bit more of dirt underneath here. But anyways, this is basically the process of the texturing inside of Photoshop. I have a texture outside of uh, ZBrush that I'm painting. 
I'm controlling in there using, uh, you know, all the layers. I'm turning stuff on and off. And all I really wanted to do is just show you the process of creating a texture in there, moving it back in here, and keeping all the layers intact so that at any time I could remove, for example, these patterns. I, if I wanted to clean up this t-shirt and remove any stains, I could just turn off the stains uh, layers and resave the same texture as a different variation so I could have a t-shirt clean, t-shirt dirty, and I could just load it up in there. If I'm going to be creating a bump map, I could very easily do that by graying everything out and just making sure that the pattern that I have is in fact intact. And um, and yes, as far as that, that's uh, all there is. Next, I'm going to go ahead and just work on the pants. The process will be pretty much exactly the same as I have here. And I guess I just I probably have to work on this uh, this little thing here, the belt buckle as well. But again, for the most part, uh, you know, these pants will be all in the, that I'm going to be focusing on. Now, I still have this section as well, these little doodads here, and I actually haven't unwrapped them. But to be honest, uh, you know, how com considering how simple it is, I'm probably just going to skip the section altogether. I'm just going to probably clone something here and just paint it up. Um, I, th I think these pants are a lot more challenging to work on, and uh, you know that they'll definitely, it'll, you'll, you guys will definitely get enough knowledge out of this whole texturing process to be able to do something like that all on your own. So let me just render this character from here, and then the next video I'm going to go ahead and just start working on the pants. So that's what we got so far.